Thanks for coming to this talk. I'm really excited to share with you today what we've been working on at Disruptor Beam. We've been working on a game called Star Trek Timelines. Just to give you a little bit of background on the company, we started as a non-Unity company, so we shipped our first game called Game of Thrones Ascent about two and a half years ago. Uh, it's a lot of 2D graphics, it's a lot of text in it, but it's gotten about 10 million installs, and that has really propelled the company over the last couple of years to where we are now, which is about 50 people. Um, along the way, we discovered that the pain of shipping on three different versions of our own client, so Android, iOS, and web was um, just insanely painful. So we didn't want to do that anymore, but we also wanted to bring a lot of depth and 3D graphics and really console-like production values to our games. And that's what led us to make the decision about two years ago to move towards Unity as our platform. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're building first and just give you a preview of the game. And really, for the first time today, we're going to be diving into the technology of Star Trek Timelines to show you a little bit about how we're building this game. Um, is anyone here a Star Trek fan, or do you like? OK, awesome. Good. All right, so you don't need me to tell you that this is probably the, uh, one of the largest franchises in the entire world. It has about 100 million fans in the world. Um, so it's really big. There is no Star Trek multiplayer game on any of the app stores today. So when we launch this game, it'll be the first. What did we want to accomplish with this? So there's a few things that this game really needed to do, and that's some of the in-game graphics. And I'll show you a video in the moment just to show you a little bit of what the game actually does. But first of all, we wanted to up our own production values as a company from the 2D graphics we did with Game of Thrones and do something really amazingly immersive in Star Trek but not just relative to ourselves. We wanted to create the best mobile 3D graphics space exploration game that had been ever made. So we really pushed ourselves to do that. And you're going to see a lot of the technology when Jason talks to, to introduce you to how we actually did some of this stuff. And by the way, I noticed in the agenda it listed us as a beginner talk. I have no idea how that happened, because this is the opposite of a <laughs> beginner talk. Uh, you're going to learn some amazing stuff that I don't think anyone has ever done before in, in Unity, which is really cool. Um, it's also a multiplayer game. It's got a big galaxy, so you can travel all over the place. So we had to develop methods for kind of refactoring the MMORPG experience into something that could fit into mobile. We had to develop new ways to deliver assets to people kind of on demand, specific to particular scenes and whatnot. Um, and it's just beautiful, and there's a lot to do in it. So it's a type of game that I don't think anyone has ever experienced on mobile before. And to, to kind of give you a preview of that, I'm just going to show you a quick one-minute video of some of what happens in, in this game. Now, when people look at it, sometimes they think that this is a console game. But in fact, the graphics that you're seeing here will run on an iPad. And we're going to be shipping this game on Android devices, iOS devices, WebGL, PC. So there's a lot of different ways to, to actually play the game. So this is just a part of the game called Starship Battles. There's several pieces to it. Yeah, so this, this is the kind of stuff you'll actually be able to do on a phone, which to me is amazing because 50 years ago, which is how old Star Trek is now, they had the communicator device, and everyone thought that was an insanely impossible technology at the time, but now we can actually do 3D rendering on a device about that size. It's just a part of the game. So you know, one more thing before we move to Jason. I, was, I also wanted to talk about culturally how we've approached a game like this. So at Disruptor Beam, one of the things we found was important was not to go down the hyper-specialization route that's very common in AAA game development. So for us, we love deep skills. We love people to know how to program shaders from scratch. But we're not looking for someone who's just a tech artist. We're not looking for 3D artists that just do texture maps all day. We're looking for people who can really do a lot. Um, we have team members who have really broad technical skills, but virtually everybody gets involved in highly creative aspects of the game development process. 
3D artists that we have in-house are cross-trained in things like tech art, shaders, coding, et cetera. So there's no such thing as an in-house 3D artist at Disruptor Beam who just works in, in modeling, for example. You have to actually do modeling, bring it into the engine, do your own shader work. If there's really, really advanced shader things, then we have people like Jason who can help you figure that out. But it's really about having this, this wide set of skills that you can apply to any given project. Um, programmers participate in design discussions. And I think as a, in his general rule, we look for talent above crystallized skills. So we brought people into the team who haven't worked on Unity before, and we're fine with training them into that skill set if we think they really have the ability to learn fast, solve their own problems, operate autonomously. So the advantages of this approach to product development is really a lot more autonomy, more ability to take an idea all the way through and the, a greater ability for us as a company just to challenge each other. Disadvantages, it's not easy to find people. And we have a high bar, which means there's a very low acceptance rate in the hiring process at the, co at the company. When we're recruiting a position, um, we spend a lot more time interviewing as one data point. We, I'll, I'll just give you the, what the funnel looked like for the last 3D artist we hired. We had 350 applicants and we uh, did portfolio reviews on about 50 of those, and that winnowed down to seven interviews. We hired one person. So that's, uh, that's what our hiring process looks like at Disruptor Beam, and, and it's something we spend a lot of time on to, to get the right people. So speaking of which, I want to introduce you to a legend in the Boston area. I'll embarrass him a little bit. Uh, Jason Booth has been involved in some of, the some of the most amazing games that have cr been created in this area, starting with MMORPGs, really the first MMORPGs with Asheron's Call, all the way through you know, hit games like Rock Band. So Jason's going to take you through how we actually built some of the stuff in Star Trek timelines. And, and hopefully, you'll walk away with some things that you can actually put into practice within your studios. Jason. Great. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, I've done a lot of roles. Uh, I actually dropped out of music school to get into the game industry as an artist, and now I mostly write code. Um, so we had a bunch of goals we set out for the project in the beginning, uh, high quality visuals, uh, but running on an iPad 2, uh, which is an incredible pain point. Uh, we needed to ship on many platforms at once, including WebGL, uh, which is another uh, pain point. And, uh, we want to be able to dynamically download new content uh, to the game without going through the app store submission process, uh, new missions, new areas, pretty much anything that we, can, um, uh, we want to add to the game we should be able to do without shipping new content. And uh, so for that, we need a really con uh, rapid content pipeline. And then free-to-play games are really about low friction experiences. If you have large downloads, large loading screens, any sort of weight or uh, annoying experience, people will just stop playing right away. Uh, so we need you know, the app to be really tiny, and we need minimal load times throughout the entire app. So uh, I'm a big fan of procedural generation. Um, I like it as a tool more than as a solution. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a bit about some of the stuff we do with uh, a lot of shaders. Uh, and stuff like that to uh, generate a lot of our content. Uh, so these are what I call one-click results. So you go into our editor tool, you hit a button, and this is your starting point. Uh, it's just sort of randomizing all the parameters and producing scenes. Uh, so I went in, clicked four times, and I have, these are the four shots I got uh, for areas. And then you would go in and customize this and take it further from there. So it's a great way to sort of get your starting point. Uh, so the way this works, when we built the system, we weren't sure about a lot of aspects of the game design and what we needed to do. So I took a really conservative approach to make sure that it could work in runtime uh, or as a compile time tool. Uh, so we generally have, uh, for each system, we have uh, a couple different components. One is a generator, which holds all the information about the procedural generation. I tend to use curves for probability uh, rather than using you know, ranges and things like that. And so that gives us a lot more control over things. And then when we have things like lists of textures, we actually have to be careful because if you had this in shipped with the game, it would then include all these texture references, and we don't want that. Uh, so what I actually do is I write a, um, a little custom editor and an attribute that makes a string uh, look like it's an a and act like an object reference. Uh, and this also gives me a place to verify that people are putting the right type of content in there if I want, which is a really nice way to do it. So when the generator runs, it creates a descriptor, which actually holds all the data about how to construct you know, a planet or whatever the particular uh, piece of content is. Um, and so this is nice because it doesn't mean 
we, we don't have to manage all the materials and things that are created. They'll all get created at runtime rather than having all these files all over the place. Uh, so you can kind of think of it like an inline material um, and mesh and other stuff. And then to coordinate all the colors of everything, we have a lot of different types of palettes for the backgrounds, for the planets, things like that, so that we can set all these colors in sort of a, um, a set that gives it a nice look together and coordinate it. So I'm going to go through each layer of the rendering uh, and how it works and some of the tricks used. So first up, uh, stars. Uh, I do the stars, basically, in a vertex shader. Um, all the stars are created at zero. And then information in the vert vert vertices allows me to push them out uh, into the world and then pulse them and animate them and actually have an index stored in there as well. So I can easily say, hey, I want less stars and start uh, basically turning the alpha to zero on some of the stars. And if I need more than the 3,000 that are in the initial mesh, I just in instantiate this mesh and give it some random rotations. And uh, that gives me complete control over how many stars and how dense I want it uh, very, very cheaply with no overdraw because um, we're not drawing like a, you know, a giant cube map. The nebulas, um, what I do is I pack a lot of noise textures together uh, that I generate in various programs. Um, essentially, I use two channels of the noise for the basic shape, and I use a third one to distort it and sort of uh, clamp the ranges of it. And then I tend to use gradients to map the actual colors to them and uh, blend them together in different ways. Uh, to create the, the nebula backgrounds. And so these have a little distortion animation on them and stuff that kind of makes them shimmer, which looks really nice. Um, so this is probably the weirdest effect in the game. Uh, I wanted to get more of a 3D uh, fog than normal. Uh, so what I actually do is I render um, a very similar pass to the, to the nebulas into a really low res buffer. I take this buffer and I use the um, color and alpha information to control the density of the fog for that particular frame. And so this allows me to cut out spots of the fog so that the stars will show through and the background will show through more clearly and gives the fog a more textural look. If you turn it up too high and you don't get the parameters right, it can look a little funny, uh, a little too exaggerated. But if you use it right, it really adds a nice three-dimensional effect. Uh, but I really, um, so the next thing is, is the flotsam, which is uh, essentially how we strewn objects around the world. Uh, a lot of games will use just sort of random to do this. And, uh, Random just looks random, uh, and I like coherent noise for things like this. Uh, so what I did was generate a cube of 3D noise uh, that I cache as just a float array, uh, and I use that to, to look up rather than actually generating the noise on the fly because it's too slow to do that, uh, especially on something like the iPad 2. And so I'll use that same noise, and I'll just use different uh, frequencies of it, basically uh, subtracting it from itself to create almost like a Swiss cheese pattern. And then I'll use one noise over the whole level so that it never repeats. Uh, and so it's a very, very fast way to create a co coherent look to your uh, random functions rather than just sort of scattering things randomly. So the next effect is, is um, what I call the mist. And it looks like we've lost internet, so I'll just flip and show the video. Um, so I wanted to create a real volumetric effect, and I played around with a lot of like ray casting techniques, things like that. Couldn't get anything that would be fast enough and work right. So what I did was I um, took a bunch of planes for each little chunk of the mist, and they're all intersecting each other. And then uh, if you would turn on edge, you would see this really nasty artifact. So what I do is do a dot product versus the camera and figure out where the edge is and just fade it as it's on the edge. And so then I just put these all over the scene to create using the same noise functions to create a really nice sort of volumetric effect as you fly around, which I can then fade out as the camera gets close. Um, and I can also uh, fade out as, as it gets close to Z buffer objects. And so this gives you really nice volumetric effects, but it's got one sort of fatal flaw, which is that it creates a massive amount of overdraw. So let me get back to my format here. And so, yeah, so you can see, like, the scene is just covered with all these planes, right? And that's going to kill our fill rate. So what I do for this is I render this to a low-res buffer. I downsample the depth buffer, render it all to a low-res buffer that's either 1 8th or 1 4th of the screen resolution, depending on the platform. And then I resolve that back to the main frame buffer. And I use the difference between the low-res depth buffer and the high-res buffer to figure out which pixel to pick. If you choose the, essentially, the nearest depth value then it'll fix up all the edge seaming, uh, assuming you've you know, uh, z-tested all your particles. Uh, 
in your shader. Uh, if you don't understand how this works, it's been used in a bunch of AAA games, like Batman Arcane Asylum used it. Um, uh, I've actually released all the code on the App Store. Um, and so this is a great speed up, because if you want to have lots of alpha in your scene, and it's particularly low frequency information, you can render a ton of alpha planes with this, and then blip them back into the scene, and it ends up being you know, 30 to 40 times faster than if you would actually render them at full resolution. Uh, so as soon as this gets approved, it'll show up on the App Store. Uh, so people can just download it, and it's free. So putting the layers together, we start with the stars. We bring in the fog, which is the sort of dusting layer. Bring in some nebula. Uh, bring in the mist, which is, again, easier to see when you're moving around the level. And then bring in the uh, flotsam and, uh, and asteroids. And so you start to get the, the backdrops procedurally built. Uh, so next up, I'm going to talk a little bit about the planet rendering. So the first problem is with mapping a sphere is, is you have the problem of the pinching at the top of the sphere. Uh, it's not very um, easy to modify your textures to fit with this. Uh, so a common trick to get around this is to use triplanar texturing. And basically, you're just in my case, I just use the vertices to generate UV coordinates from each side, kind of like you have projectors around your object and you're projecting onto it, and then blend between the textures. I could have gotten away with two textures here, but I, I use the third uh, because uh, it gives me more variation in how the planets come together. Uh, and then one thing that's common throughout almost everything in our game is we don't have uh, traditional textures. We tend to pack a lot of information into textures. So the planets use a texture which is essentially a height value um, and then the, the first two components of a normal map, uh, basically the offset in x and y in tangent space. Uh, so this lets us um, sample you know, this texture once and get all this information. We can reconstruct the Z component of the normal map uh, using some math, or in our case, we actually found it looked better just to stick one in there and be done with it. Um, so it sort of depends on the look uh, that you're going for as to whether you have to do the reconstruction. Uh, and then all these maps are tiling so that we can scale them and uh, warp them at different sizes to create different combinations of planets. So to get the color, I gradient map it. So this is just a, a very simple 256 by 1 gradient. I take the height value. That's my UV coordinates. Now I have a color, and I've colorized this. And when you light it, it starts to look like a planet. Um, so once you know the height, you can do a lot of stuff with that. Uh, it's very easy to uh, you know, set a water threshold. In this case, if you take the water height and subtract it off, you know everything below 0 is going to be underwater, and everything above is going to be uh, you know, above water. And so if you just uh, multiply that up and saturate it to clamp it between 0 and 1, you get a mask that you can use to lerp between the water areas and the non-water areas. Additionally, because you know what's below water, you can figure out how deep the water is and use that as a shading on the water. And you can also do some math to figure out where the shorelines are and give each of those a different uh, color and material treatment. And you start to get uh, the water in the different areas of the, the planet uh, coming in. Uh, you can use the same tricks to do things like technology on the planets and, and light overlays uh, to, to make them you know, light up on the back, stuff like that, and start bringing in other details. And what I'll do for, for things like this, uh, like the lighting overlays, is I just, in the vertex shader, I figure out where the polar areas are so that I don't bother to map it there, and then you don't see any of the polar issues that you would get if you don't uh, triplanar texture it. So next up is the clouds. Um, I want these to roll and morph. So what I do is I take two alpha-8 textures, and I move them really slightly differently from each other, and then multiply them together so that you get a Boolean of the two textures. And so this creates a rolling effect where the edge is always changing on the clouds. And uh, I use just a PAL function to, to control the overall level of the clouds. Now, if you raise it too high, it sort of oversaturates. But um, within some reasonable parameters, it looks really, really nice and gives you nice control over the cloud density. And so if we want to do cloud shadows, we can just compute that same thing, but we can use the light vector to offset the UVs uh, to basically shift the, the uh, area we're computing shadow for away from the sun. And then we know where the shadows go. And uh, to get them to blur a little bit, you can use Text2D bias, which will look in a lower mip map and allow you to get a blurrier version of your texture. And that gives you a blurry undershadow for your clouds. So then you start to layer this all together. It starts to look pretty nice. Um, the lighting for this, 
I do a couple different lighting models. For the, the planet itself, I just, it's a very simple n.l uh, diffuse and, and n.h uh, specular. There's no PBR or anything uh, complex on it. And then I do a global lighting over the planet. And I also do an atmospheric uh, color, colorization to deal with uh, the edge on atmosphere effects. Uh, and the global vertex lighting is really to deal with issues. So if I don't do the vertex clamping, um, what I actually do is I generate the lighting in the vertex shader of a sphere and uh, give it a really harsh fall off around the, um, you know, the zero angle of the light there and uh, use that to clamp the main lighting so that things don't backlight on the planet that shouldn't because the normal map is going to turn them around towards the sun, right? And then suddenly you have light highlights where you never would because you'd have shadow there. So that fixes that up. Um, so this is just using a bunch of palettes, randomizing the parameters with the same three textures. You start to get some really different uh, planets right away, different types of landforms, different water levels. Uh, you start getting all this variety. When you actually start to mix in different textures with this, um, you can get some really, um, really diverse uh, planets. Um, oh, hey, video's back. And so these things hold up when you're really close to them as well, which is really nice. Um, maybe video isn't back. Let's go here. There we go. And so, you know, we can actually get really close to these. Everything holds up in detail. Uh, I'm just randomizing the parameters here so you can see how in real time it's all adjusting and just generating new planets as I hit the button. So yeah, shaders are awesome. Um, they're also really fun to program, so if you're afraid of them, don't be, because they're some of the most fun stuff to do. All right. Uh, so. Uh, I have two versions of the shader. I have the 3.0 version, which does a little more specular work on the water. And then I have a 2.0 version. Uh, in, in OpenGL 2.0, you've got to stay under, I think it's 64 instructions. Um, so you really have to cram everything into the vertex shader if you can and, and optimize it. Um, it has some other features I didn't talk about uh, too much, like the lighting on the back of the planet versus the front and uh, being able to do emissive water, which allows you to easily make like lava planets and things like that. Uh, but if you start making something like this, you know, you start figuring out these little tricks that you can do with it. Um, so next up is the ship rendering. Uh, the ships are really important in our game. They're sort of the most iconic things. I mean, they have an, an entire show about a space station. So uh, it, these, these need to look really good. Uh, Alan, who's, who's the artist that John talked about hiring, he spearheaded most of the shaders and, and texture work on this uh, and figuring out how all these worked. And I mainly dealt with the level of detail issues. So we use the Unity lighting model. Um, we have some rim lighting and some variants for things like cloak effects and uh, stuff like that that we do. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a pretty stock um, lighting model from Unity. And we basically place reflection probes around the scene uh, where the user is likely to be. And we render these usually at 32 by 32. On a high-end system, we'll go a little larger, but uh, we start to lose any real gain there. And the hero versions of our ships are generated between 20 and 60,000 vertices. Something like uh, Deep Space Nine is closer to 60. Uh, the modeling, uh, what we do is we bake into the, amb uh, the vertex colors. Uh, we bake an ambient occlusion. We bake, bake mass for where uh, impulse engines should glow, warp color should glow, uh, things like that. And then what we can do is just multiply these out in the shader uh, to turn the lights on and off or change the colors of them if we need to, uh, and so they don't have to be baked into the texture. Uh, we do a dual texturing on them, so we have two sets of UVs, uh, and it's because we need to get such high detail on some elements. Uh, they're highly repeated, and other elements uh, won't lay out under those UVs well. Um, so we basically have two sets of UVs for the two different layouts. And you end up with some extra geometry for things like the little guide lights and stuff that are on the ship. Um, so, so this was what a texture layout looks, for, looks like for one of these ships. Um, we since, since switched to all these to be square, but uh, that was uh, an initial mistake made in this guide. Um, and what you'll see is that, like the other uh, textures we do, most of the time they're just masks and information uh, packed into the texture as opposed to things like color. Um, and then that way we can actually colorize these things however we want in the material. So obviously 20 to 60,000 polygons is not going to run well with, uh, you know, seven textures and a really complex PBR shader on an iPhone 2. Uh, so we need to do some LOD generation, and we need to do that anyway for the space battles. 
Um, and we use SimpliGon for this, which I uh, spent a lot of time with integrating into uh, an engine at my previous company. And so one of the big features that SimpliGon can do is bake these things called proxy LODs, where they basically take your model and all of its materials and meshes and everything, and then bake it all down to a brand new model with brand new textures that's all packed tightly into, so it can be one draw call. Uh, but it doesn't do anything about uh, reducing shader complexity. Um, and so we'd like to get a simpler shader as well, but retain the look of all these uh, masks and you know, maps together. And so I did something I call render baking, which is I basically take every triangle in the model and I render it out. And if you think about a surface shader, if you've ever written a surface shader, at the end of that surface shader you assign like albedo, normal, et cetera. Um, that's the out, or those are the inputs to your lighting function. So I render out the inputs of the lighting function to a bunch of textures. Uh, and so that bakes all of our, like, oh, we have two different diffuse maps and two different normals, combines those all together into the final normal, bakes that out for every triangle in the mesh, and then it reconstructs the mesh pointing to these new materials and textures and sends that all up to SimpliGon, which then puts it all back together, which is pretty amazing. Um, and so then we get this nicely tight packed texture back which we then pack further. So it gives us a bunch of the individual textures. And then what we do is we go, OK, let's put the, you know, the diffuse or the albedo into the RGB. And we'll use an emission mask uh, for where the emission should go in the final, uh, final shader. And then we can pack our normal XY and our roughness into another map. Um, so this is super tight. And again, we can reconstruct that uh, Z component of the normal map uh, using a bit of shader math or just skip it and use one uh, if we're rushed for, for instructions. Uh, so now, at this point, our ships are one draw call for everything, and there are two texture samples, and we're done. So we have a, a low-end version of this ship that has a fast shader uh, and a decent-sized mesh. And this is unfortunately a little old. It's still got some artifacting uh, due to gamma conversion stuff. Uh, but you can see that you know, we start with our 21,000 vertices and immediately drop to about uh, 3.6K uh, vertices, and then just go down from there. And the nice thing is, is that um, we only really need this really high model when you're really in close. So uh, most of the enemy ships and things you'll, you'll see in the game are using one of the proxy models. Um, and then we just use this to make the player's ship, which you know, they may have paid money for, uh, look really, really amazing. Uh, so for post-processing, we do our custom uh, fog, which I talked about earlier, and our screen particles, and we use a a bloom with a dirt filter on it, and then we use the Unity standard uh, chromatic aberration and blur. And then I did a bunch of work on temporal anti-aliasing, which is actually um, something I'm, I'm really psyched to hear that Unity is going to tackle because it's a, a very big subject. Um, and I might use that uh, for shipping on PCs where the pixels are bigger, uh, or I might just wait until Unity implements theirs, which will probably uh, be more complete. Um, and uh, the other thing I was going to look into is using GGX instead of B Blin Fong because Blin Fong produces so many specular highlights. It, it, that's, that's one of the main things driving us towards wanting better anti-aliasing. Um, and so if we switch to GGX as our uh, specular term, it'll look a lot better. And since Unity is doing that work, uh, maybe it'll just happen. So that gives us our varying ship models for LODs and potentially for low-end hardware, but there's a lot of other shaders going on here for the planets and stuff, and we really need to hit the iPad, too. Um, and we also just need to deal with the scene complexity changing as we play the game. And so I have a runtime performance analyzer that sits there, looks at the, you know, at load time, it basically looks at the uh, device it's on, figures out a, a rough area it should, should be in in terms of performance, and then decides what size textures and, and assets to download from there, uh, which we use the asset bundle system for. And then it monitors your frame rate and will adjust the quality of your post proc and things like that to sort of even out frame rate issues and, uh, and get us to a, to a reasonable frame rate at all times. And then what it does is at one point in the tutorial, it sends this up to the server uh, so that we actually are getting uh, data back of what these settings were set to for different devices because there's so many different Android devices out there. And then we can actually look at these, tune them, and use them as the starting profile for people who, who connect with that device in the future. Um, so if you look at the Unity hardware survey, survey uh, this, this terrified me when I first saw it. Uh, 512 meg device on iOS is essentially the iPad 2 and the iPad uh, mini uh, first gen. And I was like, this can't be right, like 31%. 
And so I did a bunch of things to verify this, including checking our own data on our last game about who was paying for our game. Because I thought maybe these are old devices that people with kids are using and they're not downloading apps anymore and we don't have to worry about them. And our numbers pretty much exactly match these. So if you are not supporting an iPad 2, you're, you're basically lopping off 30% of your market right now. And all those people are going to give you one stars when it doesn't work. So uh, 512 meg devices, great. So on a 1024 meg device, like the, the, the model released the very next year, you have about five to 600 megs for game data and assets and stuff. That's, that's pretty great. Um, when you drop down to a 512 meg de device, the OS plus Unity takes so much that you're left with about 75 megs to run your game in. So that's an order of magnitude uh, less memory, or almost an order of magnitude less memory that you have to run in, which is a, a challenge. So first of all, those devices are not going to draw our giant hero ships. They're going to only use the proxy models. Um, we lower the texture resolution. Uh, we try to use 2BPP uh, compression wherever we can. Uh, for a lot of things, it looks all right. And then when people start complaining that their stuff, you know, their UI or whatever looks bad, then we'll go in and look at each of those cases and try to raise them up where we can. Uh, we don't do any image effects. And we use much simpler shaders across the board. So all our shaders have LODs for the low end platforms. Um, so for the backgrounds, for all these nebula and complex shaders we're doing to make things look really pretty, uh, the first thing we do is that we actually bake out a cube map. And I used to do this at runtime, but then you don't get texture compression. So I bake the whole thing out uh, as a compile step, including the mist, which is a, a sad loss I may try to rectify in the future. Uh, but all the nebula and dust and everything are all now in a cube map, which draws very fast. And then I do the same thing for the planets. So the planet's a sphere. It's very easy to unwrap this into um, you know, essentially a flat plane. And I fake some lighting on it and render a texture. And now I'm just a diffuse texture, and I'm done. And once you put the clouds and the atmospheric effects and things like that over top of it, it's, it's not as big a deal as uh, I originally thought it might have been. Uh, and it tends to look pretty good. And because these are texture compressed, you're saving a lot of memory anyway. Uh, so you've got to be really diligent if you're going to ship on this platform. You have to basically treat it like another platform. Uh, almost all your assets are going to need a version for a 512 bank device. Um, and you really have to test it like another platform. Um, it's very easy for people to check in the high-res models and not realize uh, that they broke something in the low end because they, they're all running on iPad Air 2s and everything looks great. Um, so I added the ability to simulate all of this in the editor so you can actually play the ed editor and put it in LD mode and see what the game looks like on a low end device uh, and see it all while you're working. And you got to be in the profiler all the time. Um, I'm a big believer that the GPU should always be your bottleneck. Uh, we barely use the CPU at this point. Um, it tends to spike up occasionally, but it, it doesn't really do a whole lot. Uh, if the GPU is not your bottleneck, it means you could be drawing a prettier game. Um, so here's the game running on an iPad 2. I took a couple of screenshots from it. It all looks very similar. You know, you get a lot more sort of edge aliasing from resolution issues and things like that. But, uh, but overall, it plays and looks pretty good and maintains the 30 frames a second um, through most of the game, or at least the parts we've optimized. We have a few. We have a lot more to optimize, but it's, it's getting there. Uh, so next, I'm going to talk about dynamic content. Um, so the early approach, the advice I got from everybody when we were on Uni4 was like, steer clear of acid bundles if you can, if you can do that. Uh, because they're a, you know, they have a horrible reputation. And I have to say, the reputation is kind of deserved. Um, so my initial attempts were to squeeze the base assets the game needed into 100 megs and figure, OK, we'll figure out how to update those later. And then all the scenes, all those descriptors were serialized into JSON, which we could deserialize and reconstruct on the fly. And this worked pretty well, but it was a lot of code to maintain because I wanted to do it all asynchronously while you're flying around, going from place to place, so that you would never notice that you were loading. Uh, for all the, there's a lot of character portraits of all the characters in the game and uh, icons and things like that. Uh, and then you have the store where you're going to have like today's sale and all those things. So those were all PNGs loaded off the web server, um, which is great because it meant uh, the content people didn't who were doing that work didn't have to understand. You know, our marketing team didn't have to understand Unity. They could just drop stuff in a folder and and be done. Uh, but uh, there's a problem with this. Is first of all that WebGL really needs to be tiny. Uh, WebGL when you run under WebGL. The app will not show anything except blackness until you actually finish loading 
the initial uh, code, compile it, and then load the initial resource bundle. So if you have a really large app in WebGL, you're going to lose most of your players right at that initial load. And so you had to get everything out of the main app. Uh, loading PNGs through the WWW interface, it causes massive blocks on the main thread, and you don't get texture compression, which is the problem on low-end devices. Um, so even though Unity has these options, they're not really usable for anything beyond prototyping. And then we had a bunch of design changes as the, the design actually hardened, and suddenly a lot of the requirements that were initially put on the system weren't needed anymore, so I could really get in there and, and optimize this. And so now everything in our game is in bundles. Um, we tend to pre-cache things. Uh, as the user's moving around, when they discover a new area, we'll start downloading that right away. Uh, the tutorial can be marked up with commands that said and say, hey, the ship's going to be needed in a minute, so start downloading it, so that we'd never really see um, long loading screens unless you're on an incredibly slow connection or uh, something like that. And then everything ends up being in all these different variant levels, and that's uh, a real problem uh, because you end up with duplicate copies of your uh, assets and things for the different uh, versions, and a lot of times those changes are really just texture compression and texture size changes, and so having multiple copies in the tree just for that is a problem for both the cache server and for just workflow and people updating one but not the other. Um, so I'd love to find a way to get rid of that someday. And then we support all the different Android texture compression variants. So if you're on an Android device and you, uh, you know, you're on an OpenGL 2.0 device and on Android, uh, you probably only support one, uh, you probably support e uh, ETC, to ETC texture compression you support and then one of the other ones you might support. And so for RGBA textures, they won't get compressed. They'll actually get decompressed. Uh, in Unity 5.1, it would decompress them into 444 uh, four textures in Unity 5, it, it does full RGB 38 or 32 textures for them. So they take up a ton of memory. So we actually make separate copies of all our asset bundles for each Android texture compression format. Then look at the GPU strings when you load, figure out what vendor made that GPU and what texture compression formats it actually supports, and then start downloading from those bundles instead. So the result of all this work is that on iOS Universal, we are 39 megs, uh, which is tiny because it basically includes a bunch of different copies of the executable. With app stripping, it'll be smaller than that. And on WebGL, we're about 15 megs of actual code data with two megs of data that's included with it, which makes our startup time extremely fast compared to anything else I've seen on WebGL. And we'll likely shrink this more uh, before ship. We still have a little more cleanup to do. Uh, it does mean we have over 4,000 acid bundles now and more every time somebody adds content to the game, uh, which is a lot of acid bundles. Uh, but the nice thing is that we only pay for what the user sees, right? They're, they're not downloading every asset bundle on the, the first connect of the game. They're downloading them as they need them or as they're about to need them. And so that saves us a lot of bandwidth and cost, which on a free-to-play game is very important. So asset bundles, um, like I said, they kind of deserve their reputation. So in 4, the problem with asset bundles were, were if you didn't do something right, your assets wouldn't show up. So then they added the dependency graph and solved that for us, which is great, uh, except that it, we still basically have to do all the same work, because if everything doesn't end up in a bundle, what's going to happen is you're going to end up with duplications. If you have a texture that's used in two different materials, and those materials are in two different bundles, and you don't bundle that texture, it's going to uh, put that texture into both of those material bundles. And if they both get loaded, you'll end up with two copies of it in memory, which on a 512 meg device is going to run you out of memory really quickly. Uh, so you pretty much have to get everything into bundles and get it all right uh, either way. Um, it's very easy to end up you know, making a bundle of like particle effects, and you run into a case where half of them aren't used in the game anymore, and now you're downloading all this data that you don't actually need. So when you're downloading bundles, um, in Unity 5.2, we use the WWW class. Unity's recommendation actually is to write your own uh, platform-specific downloader for this until 5.3 ships, where they're actually going to fix this issue. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, it allocates the memory for the asset bundle uh, in the mono heap. And if you know anything about the garbage collector in the mono heap, once you allocate memory in the mono heap, you never get that back. So this raises your high watermark on your app, and then you have to fit into that much smaller of a space. So if you have really large asset bundles, you're putting 30 megs of stuff into a single asset bundle, well, that's 30 megs of, of mono heap memory you're never getting back. Um, it's going to allocate that and keep the heap size that large from then on. 
So that will crash you on a low-end device. So we have to use lots and lots of little bundles to keep things as small as possible. Uh, so that's great, but there's a little other problem with Unity, which is that if you go over 256 open asset bundle handles, uh, it won't handle that correctly. This is also supposed to be fixed in 5.3. Um, unfortunately, that's past our shipping date, so uh, we might end up shipping on a, on a beta. Um, we are currently managing things so that we stay under that right now, but it's not, uh, it's not pretty. Um, so yeah, I talked a little bit about having multiple copies of everything in the, in the tree. The other big problem with asset bundles is you're really asked to organize your scene, your, your project twice. Right? You have the project folder as you know it, and you use it all the time. And then you have your asset bundle structure, which is an entirely different structure for your entire game. So I think that's uh, a big problem with it. Uh, and then all these compression times, um, you know, especially the low-end compressions for uh, PBR2 and ECT2, they're both unbelievably slow. And so we're, uh, you know, we have an extensive cache server set up with a RAM drive and you know, and everyone's connected to it, and it's, we still run into cases where people are down for an hour or two just because they're stuck on caching. Um, and then one little trick that got us a bunch of times before we figured out what was going on was the asset bundles errors that happen in the log. It's, they're not all prefixed with asset bundle error or something that's easy to find. Um, so what we do is we delete the, the main asset bundle manifest, build all the asset bundles, and if it's not there, we know we have an error somewhere in the log, and we have to go find that string, figure out what it is, and then put it into our uh, continuous integration system so it knows what that error is from now on. Um, obviously, we now have tons of loading pathways. We want to be able to simulate this stuff in the editor so people can work quickly. We want to be able to have them force certain variant levels of, like, I'm running an LD simulated in the editor, and then they need to be able to build these things locally for testing, run off those locally built bundles, and then they need to be able to run off the external ser server, and all of these need to work. Uh, so when you're working with this code, it's very easy to fix something in one and break something in the other or not fix it in the other. And, uh, all this building can create really huge time sucks, and so sometimes it's actually quicker just to push stuff to the actual development server, see if it works, and deal with it than it is to actually um, build all of that. But it, it's a little dangerous, and it's not the ideal we would like to, be, uh, like to be in. So I've written a ton of tooling. If you're gonna use a lot of asset bundles, you need to write a lot of tools to find out, okay, is this asset being included in more than one bundle? You know. Uh, are all the right things being included in the right places? And so we wrote an extensive series of tools that allows users to just look at all the asset bundles, find errors by color, roll over them, see what the error is, and then go fix it. But I have another approach, which I'm gonna try on our next game. Um, so once the, uh, the bugs are fixed, uh, I wanna try a model where one asset equals one asset bundle. Okay, so basically I'll write a post-processing script that comes along assigns every asset an asset bundle name based on its path. So it just takes this path and turns it into a name. And it, if that path contains one of our variant names, then it knows it goes in a variant, and then it's done. And we do this for a lot of our assets already, uh, like images for, for, the, for the characters and stuff. Um, so this has a bunch of advantages. I'll never have to worry about duplicating everything because I know everything's in a bundle and everything's in a singular bundle. And I won't have to worry about um, you know, assets that aren't needed getting loaded by mistake. Uh, my folder structure and my asset bundle structure end up being the same structure. It's just a slight naming convention difference. Uh, so there's really no chance of user error here because it's entirely forced by the system. And I won't have to worry about bundle size issues or large downloads because everything's atomic. Uh, obviously, we've got to fix that 256 uh, file handle lim uh, limit. And I suspect I'll want to do something to merge bu uh, bundles. My idea here is to basically uh, go down the dependency graph of all the assets and figure out which things are only included in one bundle and then suck them up to their parent bundles. And so every time you make a change, this might change the, the, the bundle layout, uh, but everything will be um, reasonably, uh, reasonably bundled together in optimal um, packages at that point, and no user will ever have to think about it. We'll still have lots of downloads, but less if we do the, the merging. And uh, reorganizing our project will actually change our asset bundle names, which may or may not be a problem uh, a couple times. Uh, and it'll bundle everything. So it's going to bundle a bunch of things that we don't ship, but it, it's not really going to matter um, because nobody's ever going to download that stuff. It's just a little extra space on the server. Um, so in summary, uh, low-end mobile is still a very low-end platform and very, uh, very important to support, unfortunately. Um, 
the AMD, or I forget what it was, the, the guys who do the Mali chipset asked me what I wanted from them in a future GPU, and I said a self-destruction advice for a, a routine for older GPUs. <laughs> um, so hopefully Apple will uh, get rid of these devices, but with the number of them are, that are in the market and is still active, uh, it's probably going to be a thorn in our side for quite a while. If you're planning on shipping these on these devices, you've got to start optimizing really early. Um, and if you're using a lot of fancy shaders like I am, you have to come up with tricks of dealing with baking all that down. And I think for any large game or WebGL game, uh, especially on WebGL, uh, moving your entire game out into asset bundles is, is nearly mandatory. Um, because the startup time on WebGL is going to be the number one place where you lose people. So it's a lot of uh, work. Um, the alternatives in Unity that seem uh, appealing aren't really usable at scale. Um, and so you're going to need a lot of build, uh, build tools and things like that to help you uh, deal with all of this. So yeah. Uh, yeah, look for the uh, off-screen particles on the uh, asset store. Um, if you've got a ton of alpha to render, it's uh, really fast. So hopefully that'll help you out. John, you want to say anything? Yeah. Um, this whole presentation's up on SlideShare if you want it as well. Um, I guess later the video will be available on the Unity site, but if you want a head start, and you're welcome to grab that and share it with anybody at your companies. Um, link there to Disruptor Beam. We're always looking for people that are up to these kind of challenges, want to work on these kind of problems, so talk to me later if, if that interests you. Thanks. Any questions about anything we talked about? <laughs> Thanks. Quick question about the uh, testing bundles in the editor. Yeah. Um, how did you get around, or did you find a way to get around the lovely pink shader issue? <laughs> oh, you mean when you're you're set to iOS? Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah. Or Android? Um, I don't. I mean, there's not really anything you can do. Uh, what I do support is if you say I want to load from web bundles, you have the choice of whether you want to load for your platform or the platform that uh, the Unity editor thinks it's running. Right. OK, so. thanks. Hi, uh, great talk. That was really insightful. Um, one thing I kind of latched onto earlier, I remember I've written a lot of shaders in the past, and I was trying to use Alpha 8 just to sp save texture room. but. I recall running into a problem where Alpha 8 would get expanded into all four color channels. Is that still a thing? Can we? I don't think so. I haven't, yeah. at least on any of the platforms we've been running on, I've tested it on Android, iOS. Um, you know, obviously any PC is going to be fine. Uh, from everything I've seen, Alpha 8 it stays Alpha 8 forever, which is great because Alpha 8 is a wonderful format if you do lots of shader tricks and stuff. A performance concern we've been hearing a little bit about with WebGL is that uh, the compiling of shaders on WebGL can be, can take a lot of time and resources in certain cases. Are you taking any special steps to uh, keep the load time relatively short on WebGL around that? Yeah, what I do is um, I put most of our common shaders into a bundle, and at uh, the very beginning of the app, I download that bundle and I create one of the new uh, bundle variants from code by scanning the shaders, and then uh, call warm up shaders on that so that they're all warmed up at the time while we're loading the title screen and playing the intro and stuff like that. Cool. Hi there. Great talk. Uh, I'm wondering if using the new uh, asset bundling system from Unity 5 or still the, yeah, like we're the using more the manual approach, yeah. because I figured like the dependency tracking is quite great in the new. Yeah, we're using 5. It, it definitely had some bugs in the beginning, but we sort of worked out all the kinks, at least for us. And, uh, but the main thing is the way the error metric between 4 and 5 is different. Uh, you go from, hey, this didn't work, and I see it right away, to, you know, hey, I'm looking in the profiler. And why are there three copies of all these things, right? So it sort of just pushes your errors down the line as opposed to fully solving them. Uh, your game will always look right until you run out of memory and crash. Um, so that's why I've started writing a lot of tooling around it, because to hit that low-end platform, we really have to be careful uh, with the asset bundle system. OK, thanks. Great. Thanks.